Good morning and welcome to worship. We're going to start off with a song. I love to tell the story. If you happen to have a hymn book at home, it is number 156, and we're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 3. Again, um, we'll start us off with a few announcements. Um, as you know, this is the way we'll be meeting um, until further notice. And, and I'll say from all the staff and all the production team, we sure do miss you guys. It's not the same. Church isn't the same with, with just us. So we miss you. Know that we miss you, and we hope we can get back together soon. Vacation Bible School is going to look a little bit different this year. Uh, we'll be having it on Facebook Live. It will be August the 2nd through the 5th and run from 6.15 to 7 o'clock each night. We need everyone to make a reservation, um, or to, to pre-register rather, so that we can um, have a family VBS kit for you. Kits will be available to pick up starting July 27th um, and check out new, the, the weekly news blast for registration information. Um, the next food collection for a simple gesture is scheduled for Saturday, August the 15th. Um, this is a vital program to address food insecurity in High Point, and all of the food that we collect um, supports food, pan food pantries in High Point. Um, if you're not a part of this ministry um, and would like to be, contact uh, David Lees. Um, the youth have begun to meet um, in home at, at people's homes in their yards, um, outside and six feet apart. 
um, if you would like to participate in that. Tonight, we're going to have watermelon with Willis. Um, Pastor Willis is going to come, and she has agreed to participate, at least I think she has agreed to participate in a watermelon eating contest. So um, we'll see how that goes. Um, uh, that's tonight, and then we're also serving at West End Ministries this week, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. Um, that is in the youth email that we send out. Um, it's also in the text. But if you did not get a part of, get that information and would like to be a part of that, contact me um, either on the church phone number, um, my church phone number, which is 336-812-4365, or you can email me. At this time, I'm going to call Miss Myers forward for children's time. Just tell you. Normally in the summertime, we're all scattered about and we're traveling. And traveling takes a lot of preparation. So my family would probably say that Miss Myers is what you might call a, a hotel snob. I'm pretty particular about where I stay when I travel on vacation. So um, I am one of those that loves the TripAdvisor app. You can go on the TripAdvisor and it rates every place that you can stay. It gives them stars and there's all kinds of reviews. And so when I start planning my vacation, I have some criteria. The first thing I want is a hotel that comes with a hair dryer because I don't want to pack my hair dryer because if I don't pack the hair dryer, I can pack an extra pair of shoes and you know Miss Myers and her shoe thing. Um, I like to have a hotel that serves a hot breakfast and I don't want fake eggs and I don't want fake bacon. I want my covers to be those real fluffy ones that when you come in at the end of the day, you just pull, you just flop down and they feel so good. And I want to have air conditioning that I can really crank it back and get it good and cold. And I want a hot shower and I want it to be clean. And I don't want it to be a place that um, you, you can get in from the outside. I want to walk into the inside of the hotel where it's safe and then go up and get into my room. So I'm pretty particular about my hotel. And if I was taking you guys with me, of course, we'd have to have a swimming pool because everybody needs a pool at the hotel. So it's a good thing that a long, long time ago when Jesus was calling the disciples that there wasn't a TripAdvisor app. And you know what? There's even some reference in the Bible about people being concerned about where somebody might be staying. You know, that's one of those things, too. When you plan a trip, the first thing anybody asks you is, well, where are you staying? And you got to tell them. So today in our scripture, the Bible says that the next day John was there again with two of his disciples, and when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, my friends know that. Where are you staying? Where are you staying? Oh, that's the part right there where it's a good thing Miss Myers didn't have the TripAdvisor app and she started rating where Jesus was staying because I guarantee you there was no hair dryer. There was no swimming pool and I doubt there was any fluffy sheets. I might would have seen that where Jesus was staying wasn't a four star. I might would have read reviews and backed off and not wanted to go where Jesus was staying. But you know what happens? Jesus says, come, and you will see. Come on, go with me and see where I'm staying. And they went. No review checking. No concern about where he was staying. They just went. And when they went, they spent the afternoon with him. And then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The very first thing that Andrew did after going to where Jesus was staying was to go find his brother, Simon, and tell him. And when he finds him, he says, We have found the Messiah. And, brought, and then they brought him to Jesus. How lucky were we way back when that when Jesus started to call his disciples, and Jesus walked on this earth, that people didn't care where he was staying. 
It didn't matter where he was staying. He was the man, and they wanted to follow him. They wanted to hear him, and they wanted to be a part of what he had to share. So maybe we need to remember that too, that just because Jesus might not be where we can follow him right here, walking in front of us, he can't really take us to some fancy place, but we can follow Jesus wherever he takes us. If we open our hearts to Christ, wherever he calls us now, we don't need to say, where are we going? What's the hotel look like? We just need to follow, and we need to go where Jesus calls us, just like our friends did in this scripture today. Let's bow our heads. Dear God, thank you for those first disciples who, they asked the question, where are you staying? But they didn't wait for the answer. They didn't wait for the reviews. They just followed. They just went. And aren't we glad they went? Because in the going, they learned the story, the story that they could then be a part of and share with others, the story that we near, still, near, still can hear and share with others. Thank you, God, for Jesus, your son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's enter into a time of prayer. On our prayer request list this week, we have uh, David Fleming, who is having kidney stone surgery this Friday. Uh, Shirley McNeil, who is Janice Sievert's mother, um, who is recovering from a heart cath. Uh, Shirley and Milton Farmer, the aunt and uncle of Christine Shu, who both have COVID. Milton is in the hospital with severe respiratory symptoms, um, and Shirley is recovering at home. <clears throat> Joanne Lee, Chuck Hicks, Mabel Ling, Ann Teague, Carolyn Riddle, Hazel Kirkman, Beverly Crotz, Larry Edwards are also on our prayer list. And don't forget Pastor Deborah, who is still dealing uh, with her kidney stones. Let's pray. God, we thank you for loving us. And we thank you for the many gifts that we've been giving. We thank you most of all for the gift of salvation um, through your son, Jesus. Help us to love as he loves us, to give as he so freely gave, and to follow you in all that we do, no matter the cost to us. Forgive us for not being your hands and feet and for not speaking your word like you've called us to do. Help us to see one another as you see us and to treat one another as you treat us. Help us to call our brothers and sisters, like Andrew called Peter, to follow you. Let us join together as a church body and tell other people that we have found the Messiah. Help us to lead people to your son, Jesus. And God, help us to mean it when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Our scripture this morning morning comes from the first chapter of John, verses 35 through 42. The next day, John was standing again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus walking along, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard what he said, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he asked, What are you looking for? They said, Rabbi, which is translated teacher, where are you staying? He replied, come and see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two disciples who had heard what John said and followed Jesus was Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. He led him to Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Frank Lloyd Wright, the famous architect, once told of a lesson that he learned from his uncle. His uncle was a very no-nonsense type of guy, and the two of them were taking a long walk across a snow-covered field. When they reached the other side, his uncle said, Now I want you to look back at our two sets of prints. See how your footprints go back and forth and and from the trees over to the fence and then back to the fence and then over there where you were throwing sticks. But now notice my footprints. My path comes straight across, directly to my goal, and you should never forget this lesson. And Wright never forgot it. He said, I determined right then that I would not miss out on things in life as my uncle did. How many of us have a little bit of that uncle in us? We set our goal, we know where we are headed, we set out determined to reach our goal, and then we forget to stop and smell the roses along the way. Look, we all need routines. Routines give us rhythms, but sometimes those routines get us into ruts. And I like the saying that to choose your rut carefully because you may be in it for a while. What happens in those ruts is that we become blind to new possibilities and creative pathways. Well, in today's scripture passage, Jesus challenges some of his early followers to break out of their ruts and to try something new. Now, at the beginning of the passage, they are not Jesus' disciples yet. They are John's disciples. You see, during that time, there were many religious leaders, and to be a disciple simply meant that you were a student, you were a follower, you were a learner. Well, John the Baptist was a religious teacher who had disciples. And so picture the scene. John the Baptist is standing there with two of his students, two of his disciples, Andrew and the other one. They're standing with their teacher, and then Jesus walks by. And John points to Jesus and says, there goes the Lamb of God. And I imagine that John's disciples then look at each other, and then look at John, and they're probably thinking, if our teacher, our mentor, just professed that that gentleman is the Lamb of God, Why in the world are we still following John? And before you know it, John loses two disciples, boom, like that. And they start to follow after Jesus. They begin to follow Jesus. They follow him down the road. And and I wonder how they followed him. I wonder how long they sort of hung back until Jesus noticed. I wondered if maybe, like, you know when you spot a celebrity, but you're not real sure if it's a celebrity and you want to give them some space and you don't want to hover So did they hang back, try not to be seen, or did they follow really close on to Jesus' heels and and maybe sort of clearing their throats like, like just trying to work up enough nerve to approach him? But Jesus finally notices them, 
and he turns to them and he says the first words that are recorded in the Gospel of John. The first word Jesus speaks in the Gospel of John are these. He turns to them and he says, what are you looking for? What do you seek? Jesus asks the question, what do you want? Be honest. What are you after? What are you looking for? Now, if Jesus were to ask you that question, how would you answer? If Jesus were with you this morning, sitting beside you, wherever you may be, maybe still in your robe, watching online, maybe on your screened-in porch or in the den, and Jesus was there with you, and Jesus turned to you and looked you in the eyes and said, What do you want? What are you looking for? How would you answer? What do I want? I would like some normalcy in the midst of this pandemic. I would like to meet this congregation in person. On a deeper level, I would like wisdom and a discerning heart. What about you? What do you want? If Jesus were to ask you this question, how would you answer? About a year ago, a little over a year ago, I took a two-month renewal leave. I'd been in ministry for almost over 20 years, and I had never done it before. And United Methodist pastors are given this opportunity every seven years to take a spiritual renewal leave, but I'd never done it before. But, but this had been a busy season in the life of the church I was serving. There had been several staff changes, there had been numerous deaths, and it was sort of a season of change and loss. And one of the greatest losses was the unexpected death of our church's office administrator. She was only 30 years old. She died unexpectedly in her sleep leaving her dear husband and two preschool children, and it had taken a toll on the church and on me. And I knew it was time to rest, to do what Jesus did on several occasions and get away, to rest and reflect. So at that point in time, if Jesus had asked me, Willis, what do you want? I would have said, I simply want to rest and be away. And to be in a space where I am not needed by anyone. To be in a time and a place where there are no expectations placed on me and I am not needed by anyone. Now I want to stop my story right there, sort of like we're hitting the pause button, and go back to the scripture. Jesus asked the two men who had been following him, what are you looking for? What do you seek? What do you want? But they don't have an answer. Instead, they counter with a question. Rabbi, teacher, where are you staying? Where are you staying? I mean, that's a, that's a bit odd. They trade a question for a question. This week in our team meeting, the staff discussed this scripture, and Ms. Myers noted that it's sort of a personal question. <laughs> To ask someone you just met which hotel they chose? <laughs> you know, is that really what they want to know? To know where he's staying, his, his address? To take a look at his condo? I mean, it's sort of a strange request. If the Son of God had to ask any one of us, what do you want? I think we would have our three wishes ready in hand, and we would not have wasted one of them asking where he was staying. But Andrew and the other disciple, they want to know. They want to know where he is staying. They want to know where he lives. They want to know where he is residing. They want directions to his house. They want to be with him. But Jesus doesn't give them directions. He doesn't give them his address. He doesn't put his contact information into his, their phones. He doesn't tell them anywhere about where he is staying. Instead, he offers to show them the way. 
And Jesus answers with three simple words, come and see. Come and see. So let me tell you what happened on the first day of my spiritual renewal leave. This time that I was hoping to, to get away, to have a break, to have a break from being needed. On the first day, I was flying home to Dallas, Texas to visit my mom and family and friends. And my flight to Dallas was not a direct flight. I had a layover in Atlanta. Now, here's something you need to know about me. I love to fly. I love the anonymity of it. When I travel, I really don't want to talk to many people. Now, I am friendly. Don't get me wrong. I'm friendly. I just don't really want to engage in long conversations with strangers. So I load up my Kindle with a few good books. I download some episodes of Call the Midwife. I get my snacks and my bottle of water, and I am good to go. Well, on the flight from Charlotte to Atlanta, I was on an aisle seat, and the two people next to me talked the entire time. <laughs> And I remember thinking, thank goodness they're not talking to me. I get to Atlanta. I make it to the next gate. Now, another thing that you need to know about me is I like to board last. I would rather stand around the gate area where I can walk around with a lot of room rather than standing in a crowded aisle on an airplane waiting for people to put their luggage in the overhead bins. <laughs> so when I boarded that plane, that plane was full. It was packed. And as I'm walking down the aisle, it dawns on me that I have forgotten to log back on to the internet and reserve a seat. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I never do this. Oh my goodness, I know this is what's going to happen. And I glance at my boarding ticket and I look at the diagram over the seats and I realize I am in a middle seat. A middle seat, my least favorite seat on an airplane. And then I continue to walk down the aisle and I see it. I mean, there's a gaping hole because the plane is packed. And there on the row is an empty middle seat. I see it. The guy near the window, he's got on like a muscle t-shirt. He's sort of well built. He's got on dark glasses. The woman on the aisle is a young, attractive woman, and I think, well, this is good. We're, we're all going to be comfortable here. But I get up to the row, and they are talking to each other. And I point to the seat, and I said, I think that's mine. And the guy next to the window says, she is so glad you're here because I've been talking her ear off. <laughs> and so I take out my Beats headphones before I even sit down, and I put them around my neck. This is the universal sign for, don't talk to me. <laughs> I've got other plans. But he was talking, and before I even got my seatbelt on, he was telling me that he was leaving his wife of 19 years because she had had an affair. And I'm thinking to myself, do you not see this universal sign around my neck? I'm about to watch something on my Kindle. I'm about to put these headphones on. but he had a universal sign of his own because there in his seat pocket was a folded up white cane with a red tip at the end. My seatmate was blind. Now I'm ashamed to admit this, but the first thought that ran through my mind was, really God, you've got a great sense of humor because this is the first day of my leave, the first day all I wanted was not to be needed by someone, and you sit me next to him. Come and see. And before they had even closed the cabin doors, he had told me about his wife's affair and how he had to say goodbye to his 11-year-old daughter and how he was unable to live by himself because of his blindness and he was flying to Dallas to live with his mother and his sister. He had a great attitude about it. He would say quite often, I know I'm talking your ear off. I know I sound like I'm crazy, but God has gotten me through this. And he talked a lot about God and about his faith in God and how God had been looking after him and how he had been blessed along the way and that God had given him strength. And all of this before we had even taxied down the runway. 
when the announcement was made to put electronic devices on airplane mode, he pulled out his phone. And he said, I know I'm supposed to do this, but I, I, I'm not real sure that I, that I can see to do it. And I was really surprised that he even had a phone. And so I said, well, obviously you can see a little. Well, that started a whole conversation about his degenerative eye disease and how a surgeon in South Carolina had performed this miraculous surgery and he was able to see a little, but his eyesight would continue to wane. And then we began to taxi down the runway and he became visibly nervous. And he told me that he was very scared to fly and that he had not flown in several years. I still didn't want to say anything because I knew once I said something, I would be engaged in the conversation. And I thought, well, maybe I can just ask him a question and it will take his mind off of lifting off. It would sort of ease his nerves. And so I thought, well, I'll toss up a softball, an easy question. And I said, well, tell me about your daughter. He was so nervous that he couldn't answer. So I thought, okay, I'll make it really easy. I'll ask a specific question. I said, does your daughter play sports or does she play an instrument? And he said, she plays the guitar. I taught her how to play the guitar because I play in the praise band at my Methodist church. <laughs> oh, really? I just kept quiet. And with my headphones still around my neck and my Kindle closed in my lap, I knew that I was where God needed me to be. Come and see. Oh, I heard everything. Along with all the people around us, I heard about his childhood and how he had gone to the Texas School for the Blind. But he also talked about his faith and how God had had provided for him and how his pastor had been a source of support for him. And when the flight attendant came by, I offered to buy him something off of the menu. I said, if anyone needs a treat today, it's you. He said, I've never bought anything on a plane before. And when I told the flight attendant that I would be paying for his, she looked at me with this very understanding smile and she said, thank you. Thank you for your help today. And that's when I realized that everyone around us knew what was going on. After about an hour and a half, he said, I have talked your ear off, and I haven't asked you anything about you. Do you have children? I said, well, I have an 18-year-old and a 20-year-old. And he said, gosh, you don't look old enough to have kids that old. And I said, well, yeah, you're blind. <laughs> And then he asked the basic stranger on a plane question. I knew it was coming. He said, what do you do? I said, oh, uh, you're not going to believe it. He said, try me. And I paused. I, I really didn't want to tell him because I just wanted to be Willis in that moment. And he said, well? And I said, uh, I'm a pastor at a Methodist church. And he said, I know God sent you here today. You were just what I needed. And I said, well, you were just what I needed. Come and see. We laughed for a minute. He said, uh, when you wouldn't tell me what you did, I thought maybe you were a dancer at a nightclub. <laughs> I said, nope, I'm, I'm not a dancer. I'm just a follower of Jesus. A follower of Jesus who wanted time away from being needed. But God said, come and see. And what I need from you, Willis, during this leave is for you to put aside any preconceived ideas that you have. And God said, I need you to get yourself out of the rut of what you think you need and put yourself in the middle seat. Come and see. 
And that, my friends, is how I approached my renewal leave. I would wake up each day just wondering where that middle seat might be, the place where I would come and see Jesus. And God's presence was just thick throughout those weeks. I could see God's fingerprints on everything. When I set aside my need to control and my need to have my pathway straight, God said, put yourself in the middle seat. Come and see. And it was through a blind man that God helped me to see. We live in a Christ-soaked world. The world we live in is a Christ-soaked world, as Richard Rohr, the Catholic writer and theologian, says. A Christ-soaked world where Christ's spirit is in all things and in all things is Christ. And when we put ourselves in the middle seat, the places where we really didn't think we wanted to go, the places that at first seem uncomfortable, that is where we meet him. I've thought about this pandemic, and, and I wonder if, if maybe society as a whole, if we aren't all in the middle seat, this place where we really don't want to be. And I wonder if we could just let go of our desire to return to the old ruts and see where Christ is in our midst. Come and see, Jesus says. Come and see. That's what Jesus tells the first disciples. And the remarkable thing is that they did. They weren't too controlling. They, they weren't too stuck in a rut. They left everything behind and they followed Jesus. And they stayed with Jesus the rest of the day. No one knows what they talked about or if they talked at all. It's not recorded in the scripture. But what the scriptures do tell us is that when the disciples left Jesus, everything had changed. And you know how we know? Because at the beginning of the story, do you remember what they call Jesus? They called him rabbi, which means teacher. But at the end of the story, after spending time with him, what do they call him? Messiah, the Lord. And it was by staying with him that they discovered who he was it was by staying with him. And maybe for us, it's putting ourselves in that middle seat. Come and see, said Jesus, but it is not always easy because sometimes we pack our bags with gummy bears and we load up our Kindle and we pack up our headphones and we have other ideas of what we would like to do and where we would like to go. And it's not always easy to follow Jesus. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, when Christ calls a person, he calls that person to die. There are a lot of deaths dying to ourselves that we experience when we follow Jesus. Because you see, following Jesus is different than believing in Jesus. In church, we talk a lot about believing in Jesus. We ask people, do you believe in Jesus? We ask people when they join the church, when the confirmation class stands before this altar, we ask them, do you believe in Jesus? When ordinands at Lake Junaluska stand on the stage, the bishop asks them, do you believe in Jesus? But no one ever asked me, Willis, are you willing to follow Jesus? Because to follow Jesus means to come and see and to live life in that middle seat and to let go of preconceived ideas and our need to control and to allow God's Spirit to work in us and through us. So that, so that, at the end of the day, we, like the disciples, will call him Messiah. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
with thy Lord. Abide in him always and feed on his word. May friends of God's children help those who are weak, forgetting in nothing his blessing to seek. Take time to be time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus, like him thou shalt be. Thy friends in thy conduct, his likeness shall see. Take time to be holy, let him be thy God. Not before him, whatever be taught. In joy or in sorrow, still follow the Lord. And looking to Jesus, still trust in his word. Take time to be holy, be calm in thy soul. Thought in each motive beneath his control. Thus led by his spirit to fountains of our love. Thou soon shalt be fitted for service And now may the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and in the love of Jesus Christ. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. <laughs>